There it is. Yeah. Is the gospel of Jesus Christ complete? Or must we add obedience to the law in order to be forgiven? That's the question before us today. I'm Pastor Ken Larson. I'm a visitation pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church and School, Delray Beach, Florida. The question is, what if the gospel of Jesus Christ became corrupted in the church? God forbid. We welcome you to worship at 8.30 or 10.30. You can worship online or in person. And we welcome you to this Bible study, which we broadcast Sundays at 9.30 over YouTube. Just search for Pastor Larson's Bible study. You'll find it there. And if you want to visit us, visit us, you'll find us at the corner of Swinton and, and uh, Lake Ida Road. That's 400 North Swinton and Delray Beach. Love to have you on Sunday, 8.30 and 10.30. This is an introduction, not a verse-by-verse -verse study, but an introduction to Paul's letter to the Galatians. We say, and we teach and preach, and we comfort all who come by telling them that Christ died in my place to earn complete forgiveness. There's nothing I can add. Anyone who adds anything to the free grace of Christ makes that grace incomplete and not free. I say they make it for themselves incomplete, although the free grace of Christ is, of course, complete in all of the scriptures. Now, if we look at the entire six chapters of Paul's letter to the Galatians, we can sum it up in this one phrase. It's the gospel with no requirements for deeds of the law. And we'll put a condition on that later on in our study. But for now, that's the main theme. As Paul writes, there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. All right, from Galatians chapter 1. So this is our introduction, and we have to set the scene by looking at the historical context. Early on, the Christian community consisted of Jews, almost entirely of Jews who came to faith at Pentecost or soon after. And for that, you read Acts chapter 1, where we find 120 believers gathered together, and then in Acts 2, where... Uh, 3,000 were added to the church after hearing Peter's sermon, repenting of their sins and putting their faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. A momentous occasion which resulted in the gospel being spread all over the Mediterranean world. For the believers there at Pentecost were from 14 different nations. And after Pentecost, they went home and they went home and they spread the gospel uh, where they were. Peter's experience at the house of Cornelius, in, recorded in Acts chapter 10, taught him something important. Gentiles also come into the church by believing in Jesus. Now, you can't imagine today how radical that thought was to Peter. He fought it, but God told him, don't call anything unclean that God has made clean. So Gentiles come into the church the same way as anybody else, by believing in Jesus. Paul had the same experience. You can read about that in Acts chapter 13, where he and Barnabas were going out and finding reception to the gospel among the Gentiles. However, and this is a big however, we can understand, or at least I would like you to try to understand why some of the Jewish believers, and they were believers, continued to practice the ceremonial laws laid down through Moses. These were the dietary laws and the laws regarding the festivals and other practices that were required by the laws that God gave through Moses. 
we can understand why they sincerely from the heart with all their strength and might were believing and insisting that these had to be continued. I want you to try to understand that so that when they are opposed by Paul's teaching, that we understand it's coming up against a rather firm brick wall of resistance. Hmm? Can you imagine that? So here's the controversy. Some said, if you are not a Jew, you must still come into the church by practicing, uh, practicing the Jewish customs. What? I'm using the word customs there. Uh, practices, laws, dietary, uh, ceremonial laws uh, regarding such simple things as washing your hands. God had good reason, didn't he, to ask them to wash their hands before they ate. The people who insisted on this were called Judaizers. You can pronounce it different ways. That's how I have always pronounced it. Jesus. Judaizers. Okay. And they that means they were taking the Jewish law and insisting upon it. They demanded that the Gentile believers live according to the custom of Moses. Okay. Now we're trying to understand why they had that demand. These Judaizers continued to disrupt the new churches with their demands. I want someone to read, and Judy, I, I always pick on you, I hope it's all right, to read okay. Acts 15, verse 1. Okay, no. uh, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Thank you. There was a not a proviso. You see how that is a demand and a condition. As a result of this demand, the church called the first big meeting. <laughs> you know, I, I joke around a lot, and I, I always have said this, that when Jesus comes again in glory, what's he going to find? He's going to find the church in meeting. <laughs> And I hope no one rises to a point of order. It's not in the agenda. Oh, yes, it is. Well, on this day, oh, we can't put a certain date on it. I will say it is around 50 AD, 52 AD. The church called this consul. Some people call it the first ecumenical consul, but I think that's reading a, a word back into the text that's not there. But they did call a meeting, and it consisted of those who were mm, uh, pillars, uh, fine, upstanding men who held offices in the church, Peter and John and so forth, and Paul and Barnabas and others. They met in Jerusalem, and they made a decision. How did they make their decision? We would hope they would make their decision based on the word of God, right? For an answer to this question, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to make a, an assignment for you because it's a long chapter with a lot of details. So for you who are online with me today, I'll say, take this home, write it down and read Acts chapter 15. You will get a copy of these slides I always intend to send it to you soon after our session so that you'll get a reminder to read Acts chapter 15 and get the whole thing. But we're not going to do that now. There was a second controversy as well, and it was related to the first. Must the Gentiles be circumcised and keep the ceremonial laws of Moses? And more to the point, how are Jew and Gentile believers supposed to live and worship together, as well as eating the fellowship meals together? When cultures clash, that could be a book title, couldn't it? Do you, do you see how today and in all era, eras of history, churches and cultures clash when there's a difference? doesn't have to be that way. The law of love 
is supposed to supersede all of our differences. But when two different cultures and languages and circumstances clash, even within a family, and maybe I'm speaking to one of you or two of you uh, without my knowing it, when they are supposed to live and worship together, as perhaps when a Jew marries a Gentile today, how are they going to deal with a potential controversy? There's more trouble than those two, unfortunately. The peace was disturbed by those Judaizers who were not satisfied. This is after the consul met. Some were not silenced. They kept making demands. They continued to substitute their requirements in the place of the gospel freedom that God had given them. We're going to talk more about the gospel freedom if we get there. Maybe not today, but next time in Galatians chapter 5. The gospel which Paul had preached was threatened. I'm not sure if you understand why their insistence threatened the gospel. If the gospel says we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, if you take the word alone out of there, you destroy the word grace and make it works. It doesn't matter whether those works were our works of love or works commanded by Moses, uh, by God through Moses, I should say, in the Old Testament. When you add works to gospel, it's no longer gospel. Because gospel is salvation by faith alone. That simple sentence has been condemned throughout the history of the church by those who didn't believe it or didn't understand it or wanted to add their own demands. I'm not mentioning names or denominations. The gospel which Paul had preached was threatened. Now I'm going to talk to you and let you talk to everybody by answering some questions. Number one, how is this imposition of Moses' ceremonial laws a threat to the gospel? In what way is this insistence a threat to gospel freedom? Anybody? Well, it's based on you have to do this in order to be right with God. And that's not what he's saying when we're saved by grace, grace through faith. Yeah, we're basic, we're, it's basically denying that, that God brought his son Jesus into the world to uh, be sacrificed for uh, forgiveness of sins and was died and resurrected on the cross for eternal life for us that totally denies that whole part of uh, mm -hmm. i guess part of the uh, part of the uh, scripture or part of part of the third person of cry of, of god yeah now what if they would say to you judy well we believe he died for us but we also must keep the law in order to have forgiveness in order to be saved we must what eat the we must what? The law? I didn't keep We must keep it. Oh, keep it. Yeah. Even though we believe he died for us, we still must keep the law in order to be saved. This is that imposition on top of the gospel. Um, I want you to think about that a little bit. Yeah. Pastor, Pastor, I was going to say that the imposition, um, it, it, it almost requires good works in a sense. However, um, it, well, it's like you said, as far as it was understood that, you know, Jesus's death and resurrection uh, gave us the opportunity for eternal life. We just had to believe that. But uh, forgive me if I ask, I mean, Paul wrote, I guess, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for, for by grace are you saved through faith. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that latter-day christians here but maybe those early christians i don't know if you know if paul had even had written to the ephesians uh this letter at the time 
uh, that it spelled it out. I mean, they were still formulating some of these things. And just like any new en entity, uh, in a sense, uh, you, you had people that were trying to uh, deal with, um, you know, with what I was saying and, or what had transpired too with Jesus's coming and death and resurrection. It's an interesting question. If, yeah. if you take the letters of Paul out of the New Testament, and God forbid we would never do that, but let's say that you had come upon the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because John hadn't been written yet. I think this is the question you might be bringing up. And I thought about, I have thought about this a lot. Um, you didn't have letters of Paul, or you didn't have them yet. Okay. Would you find salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Well, uh, just a, a pointing out, and you have it underlined, you're only talking about ceremonial laws, not right, the, right. The moral laws, you know, the moral law. The moral law was still in effect. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if I insist on keeping the three festivals, well, how would that be today if we all had to go to Jerusalem at Pentecost and at the Feast of Booths and the other one um, annually? And it was, logistically, it's not going to work, um, but that was required. Uh, how about the other ceremonial laws? How many sheep would have to be brought to how many altars yeah. to complete the sacrifice of Christ? It just doesn't make sense in any logistical way but also morally we cannot add anything to what christ has done and you will find the completed work of christ in those gospels and you won't find any requirement for works in order to be saved you will find and i'm sure you're going to remind me that jesus said the night before he was betrayed i want you to love one another as i've loved you he was speaking to people, at least the 11 who were left, who were already believers. Their, their faith was incomplete. Uh, the resurrection was not in their hearts or their experience. Uh, they had not yet received the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so they weren't complete yet, but the gospel was complete when he said that as he was going to the cross. And there is... The salvation by faith in him alone. I just realized I left the water on, but it needs it. We had some dry spells. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted myself because I heard somebody's uh, grass cutting, and I hope it's not ours. <laughs> well, ceremonial laws are a threat to the gospel because they add to something which is already complete. That's how I would answer it in one sentence. Here's another question for you. Think about this. What customs do we as Lutherans choose, choose underlined, what, do, what customs do we choose to follow which are neither commanded nor forbidden by the scriptures? It's a long list. Go ahead and name some of them. Drinking beer. <laughs> oh, wait, wait a minute. I, had, I didn't find that in Luther's catechism. <laughs> no, uh, All right. That's something we, some of us observe. Yeah. I was going to say we are, we do not come under any of the, uh, the food restricted food laws any longer. Uh, we as Lutherans, like Bobby said, we drink beer and we can have potlucks. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Just keep the silver spoons out of the mayonnaise. Um, yeah. That's not a custom, that's health. But so how that, about this idea of, uh, I, I like beef hot dogs and they're kosher. Um, I just like them better. It's not because I'm avoiding the pork. No. Lutherans love pork. It's, well, it would, it would be a reason that we, we do it because I guess we're doing it to... We're do God created our bodies, and he said to take good care of them, and if it helps us to take better care of our bodies, I would say it's a good thing. Right. Okay. Well, so, Pastor, I had heard uh, some of the uh, Jewish commandments, you know, about the food business, 
was actually for health. I mean, it was, right. a, it, was it was for the health of the people yeah. because of various things. Absolutely. But anyway, pointing that out. Yeah. Now, if we take certain sea creatures from waters that are polluted, we will receive some of the pollution. I don't understand that, but now we have practices that allow us to eat things that they were forbidden to use. Let me go back to the pork. That's the one I always remember. Uh, maybe they weren't able to get the pork up to a sufficient temperature to kill the trichnosis. That's not the right word. I think it is. Yeah. Well, that's the disease. Yeah, uh, oh. The trichomonas. The, uh, yeah. Or the what? Trichomonas. Trichomonas. That's the that's the guy we got to kill. Well, yeah. now yes. uh, isn't the pork pretty much free of that? Yes. Yes. And my son taught me 145 is enough. We don't have to have 160. Huh. Those dry pork chops we used to eat. Oh, they were terrible. Well, you <laughs> know, like our parents food. were taught that. Yes. And in the latter part of last century, they have found ways to raise pork, raise pigs in a way that is sanitary enough. I, I, there was probably antibiotics at first, and then we found out antibiotics were overly used yeah. also for other purposes than just killing the trichomosis, but you know, to help them to grow faster and all those sorts of things. But now so many, uh, so much of our food farmers are trying to uh and we have to be still be careful with organic or growing under better conditions more normal conditions with fertilizer and natural fertilizers and grass and uh, uh no additives to feeds and those sorts of things uh, yeah. Uh, yeah which makes food healthier as far as the food goes okay let's leave dietary okay and, and go to the other lutheran customs that are very lutheran um, I'll give you one to get you started, uh, kneeling for confession, or even having, no, no, we don't go there, uh, kneeling for confession. Pastor Larson, I actually have one I kind of wanted to add. Yeah. Um, mm. the, it, um, isn't there one uh, with, com with communion? Because when I was being confirmed recently, I remember um, going over communion and sh um, she would say like how she would say how like since we're Lutherans, the bread and wine is not a symbol. Like at, I, I, I don't I particularly don't agree with that, but I just remember she was going over that and saying like because we're Lutheran, something about the communion is a little different, like what it actually means is a little different. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, there are Christians who believe that the bread and wine are symbols of Christ's presence or that he is only present uh, symbolically or spiritually. But we believe and we teach and we confess uh, that what the Lord said, this is my body, is, is truly what it is. And we don't understand the how, but we understand and believe that it is true this is my body so we we do teach that and we don't make a lot of noise about it but uh, certainly we don't give up what christ has said so i appreciate you bring that up it's not really a custom it is a teaching um, but what customs do we have uh, i said kneeling for confession um well, I suppose, would you say like the order of our services? Because uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are certain things we uh, we put into it, but we've gone from traditional to a contemporary service. It doesn't mean it always has to, I guess, be traditional, or we don't always have to have candles, um, right. possibly. Or, or how about flowers? or flowers, or it really doesn't have to be held in a church. Uh, you know, the pastor, we, we, we hold on Easter Sunday, we hold it out in a courtyard, mm -hmm. or we hold it in a fellowship hall. When new churches are being formed, they, you know, rent buildings and are in gyms and different places. It's where two or mm -hmm. three are gathered together um, is what's important. 
I guess we don't get caught up on all the, uh, the altar cloths and the banners and those types of things. Um, even, um, even music uh, can get um, sometimes hung up in that. You know, we have, we have as Lutherans some traditional music, but uh, when you get into some of the contemporary music, some of the old, older <laughs> Lutherans don't care for the contemporary music. Uh, it's it's we, a hard we transition. Had, yes, we had, we had, as young people, we had Sunday clothes. You wore your Sunday clothes right. and you wore a suit and tie to church. Now we see shorts and flip flops and, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, felt it's yeah. okay. God yeah. accepts people however they are. But that was to us, we had so-called Sunday clothes and you only wore them on Sunday. You didn't yeah, wear them the other that. time. Yeah, Sunday were, shoes. And yeah. you honored, you honored God by wearing your best. I think that was, that was part of it. It was giving thanks to God for what you had, that we mm -hmm. did those things. We didn't do them because we were made to do it under a law it was because of uh, of loving god and showing our respect for um, right uh, for him. And the same i think it's the same with bowing and kneeling and those sorts of things okay we, we have and she mentioned the different colors that we use for mm -hmm. our you know different seasons the, the church I mean, here. That's, yeah and that's a custom but actually what what was just being described is what Lutherans choose not to follow. For example. Uh, the business of the clothing, the change in clothing. You know, um, as I think Judy said, there was no custom there. It was just, we made that custom. Well, the custom, it was also a cultural, cultural. Um, a thing because it's what people did ordinarily to honor anyone Yes. You would not go in to see the president in shorts and flip flops to use your your example. Yes. I think you would go find some nice clothes and um, and visit him if you were um, to do that. Well, we have many customs. And here's what Luther did when he reformed the church. And let's get over this thing that he was the only reformer. And let's get over the idea that he did all the reforming. Um, some things he left in place. And this is the rule that he followed. If it didn't impinge upon the gospel or the truth of the scriptures, it could be left. Um, one example that has been probably left, oh, except in a very few traditional churches in America, the icons, uh, which you find in the Eastern church, were taken out. The radical reformers insisted that everything that the uh, Roman Catholics were doing had to be swept out, and they would start with a blank room. Well, um, Luther said, if it helps people worship, if it helps them know the gospel and Jesus Christ whom God has sent, I will leave it in there. And so he used such things as stained glass windows and kept them. He used icons. Can you imagine uh, walking into a church today and finding a statue of uh, St. Paul or, <laughs> or St. Peter? It, it, I don't know where there are, there are any, but it was okay. It didn't mean you were worshiping the, the icon. And, you know, some things that are okay also can harm the babes in Christ. So you haven't... You must read what Paul says in Romans about not using uh, your freedom um, uh, in order to harm a brother or sister. I may put that in there. It's not part of Galatians, but you understand when we follow a custom, it's not, I have a right to do that. You understand? It's all with love and care of people who are one with you in Christ. So, Pastor, are you saying... Uh the, maybe the Lutherans don't do it. It's, it's um, um, but uh, the Catholics still have a lot of saints, statues of saints, and that was. Um, was he saying that was okay? Because if it didn't go against the scripture, I, I'm not he, sure what. Well, I, I, we wouldn't do it today, but he would have said, yeah, you know, they had wood carvings. Yes. Um, that were uh, used 
in teaching. Um, yeah. And we're, we're going back. You see, people are more visual than we realized. And we're really going back to being more visual. Yes. And uh, maybe that's good for the people who learn by pictures. I'm a word person and I don't do much with pictures. Mm -hmm. I guess you can tell by my slides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, when we are teaching Galatians, it is hard to find concrete picture illustrations. I could have put some in here. Let's go on. How do you distinguish between Lutheran customs the what, things that we might call tradition and the actual commands that still apply to Christians. How do you make that distinguish? Uh, how do you make the difference shown? I think even though we have customs, we don't force other people okay. necessarily to follow them in order to be a Christian. How do you know whether it's a custom or a command? Yeah. Well, if, if the custom uh, is something you have to do in order to obtain salvation. How do you know? Then, uh, then it's becoming a works. Um, you have you a custom? That, and yeah, you, the custom is becoming, it's something you have, feel you have to do in order to obtain salvation or forgiveness. Then it's being done for the wrong reason or it shouldn't be done or whatever. Right. All right. And actual commands are what Christ has commanded us, such as okay. the Ten Commandments and uh, well, communion and uh, baptism. Okay, so you're saying we go to Scripture, aren't you? Yes. Okay, that's what I'm. I'm wanting to use. Okay. Scripture alone is another sola. Yeah. Scripture alone, sola scriptura. All right, that's how you distinguish. Well, let's go on That's with the problem that they had in the first century. Here were the Judaizers. I want you to understand that they did not remove the gospel. I've said that before. They said, however, that after faith, you must add these works of the law in order to be saved. Yes. Then the works of that they were doing overshadowed the cross of Jesus. Pastor, I was just going to bring that up. I, I don't want to take you away from what you were going to say. No, though. go ahead. Uh, I, um, that uh, I don't know if you were told in in seminary that in your sermons, homilies, that it's important that you know have the SOS show us our sins, mm -hmm. uh, let us know about our, the law, and then SOS uh, save us from our sins, the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, some of the differences between some Lutherans and Christian churches is that Lutherans tried to do, you know, maybe it's from that German ethic too, you know, the, the law and the gospel is important and not just the gospel. Because mm -hmm. the gospel isn't, isn't important unless you, you know, understand the law. The gospel isn't what? The gospel is not, if, if you just have the gospel, uh, it, it, it won't, it, you won't realize um, why you need it in, in a sense. Ah, you you need the law to know that, uh, you know what, you, we're condemned miserable sinners and that we need to know that, you know, by faith that Christ has died for us and that because of that, Christ's resurrection and death and defeating the devil uh we're lost your audio so go go back to that we use the we use the law is it what is it we use it as a mirror and we use it as a um oh i'm just trying to think of the three reasons we and how we use it anybody um, remember the three yeah mirror uh Ian? It's a curb. Yeah. Curb. Thank you. And what's the uh, mirror one? curb and uh, a ruler. Okay. A guide. Measure a guide. Yourself. That's it. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Ian. If you nope. he just, just had confirmation. But if, if you keep these straight, the things that you learned in catechism, no matter when, if you keep those straight, they will help you in working through. Uh, some of the differences that you come across. Mm -hmm. 
in the, the idea of thoroughly teaching, I want to put this in here as a pastor, is we're never done teaching. We're never done preaching. Otherwise, we could have that one sermon, like Pentecost, and then say, well, now go home. We're done. We're never done learning either. <laughs> we're never done learning. And we fall back into a lot of junk that we shouldn't fall back into. No, and we fall back into confirmation. And thank goodness each year we have a wonderful refresher because of young people like Ian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That helps bring it uh, back. Let's keep on doing that. And we are wonderfully blessed by having the school right on our property where we're doing that uh, day after day, Monday through Friday. And uh, other people are coming to faith in sometimes very invisible ways that only God knows. And I'll just kind of smile at that. The, the people who were insisting on this said that faith alone was not enough. Oh, they didn't have Paul's letter to the, uh, to the Ephesians yet, huh? One must complete the work of Christ. That word complete is really onerous. One must complete the work of Christ through circumcision and keeping the other laws that God had laid down through Moses. Although you can understand how they might have insisted, when you try to complete what's already complete, <laughs> what are you doing? Well, how can you complete what is completed? Many of our works in this world are never complete. For example, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, we're never done that with that. But when Christ said, I'm going to complete the salvation, I'm going to sacrifice myself for the sins of the world, I'm going to lay down my life and raise it again on the third day. That was complete. And you know the word from the cross, it is finished, signaled that. Mm -hmm. So you can't complete what's already completed. Everybody can understand the logic of that. In the third place, the Judaizers in, intimated that Paul was an inferior apostle. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Inferior. He was not one of the original 12. Correct. His failure to insist on the keeping of the law was evidence of his weakness. In his missionary zeal, he was making it easier for Gentiles to come into the church by not insisting on their keeping the law of Moses. Again, you can understand that. And if they knew Paul's background. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, yeah, I that same thing, Joanne. Wouldn't, like, wouldn't he be the last one to eliminate mm -hmm. a, a student of Gentile, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, mm -hmm. above all everyone in keeping the law? I was above my brothers in every respect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and until Christ came, Acts chapter 9, I always said he was knocked off his horse, but there's no horse in the, in the narrative. He was knocked to the ground and he couldn't see. And all that that you read about in Acts chapter 9 and 22 and I forgot, 26, I think. It's so, you know, his salvation experience was so dramatic that he couldn't stop talking about how he was brought to faith without the deeds of the law. Mm -hmm. So um, what was it? Go ahead, Ian. No, Christine. Uh, um, the the a lot of people are bought, brought to faith, I believe, without even knowing the Ten Commandments. Okay. And that, that may sound different to you guys. You know, I used to have the Ten Commandments at my desk all my young years when I was studying in college. But um. I, I I can't say I knew anything else. But but a lot of people, if they it inherently want to believe and then become in contact with the gospel, they can be brought to faith without knowing, I think. Well, I want you to read Romans 1. Yes. Uh, when you get a chance and find out where Paul says that the law has been put on their hearts. Their conscience 
accuse or sometimes excuse them. So this, what God has given in, in, the, in putting the law upon the hearts of all people, they know what is wrong and what is right. Well, and they, they okay, so the literal Ten Commandments, yes, you are correct, but almost every society, every culture of the world will, uh, agrees that killing is wrong. Uh, yeah. They still do killing, but they, they know it's wrong. Uh, taking my neighbor's property uh, is probably more excused. And we won't even talk about the command to tell the truth. That We won't even bring that up today. I, that's my whipping boy, the one I'm on all the time uh, about all the lies in the world today. Yeah. Well, the greatest lie in the world today is that you can come to God without Jesus. That, that lie uh, uh -huh. condemns all others who think they are keeping the law according to the dictates of their consciences. And let me say a word about conscience. Um, you've heard me say this before. My conscience and your conscience and their consciences can be mistaught. And we can be taught to ignore a certain law by parents and peers and superiors and that happens i'm sorry it does mm -hmm. so you are correct people come to faith without seeing the ten commandments on your desk but they know they have the guilt and the shame of the sin that they know about yes and uh, okay so i just wanted to add that mm, uh, background to to what you said. I'm not really correcting you, am I? Maybe because our country is a country based on uh, Christianity. The Judaic uh, Christian influence has been in human law, so-called natural law, and then the codified law for centuries. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's part of it. Um, yeah. Well, I can't do that today. That's just way, that's a book length. Uh, Another study. <laughs> yeah, no, not today. Let's, let's stick to Galatians. But thank you for bringing that up. It is, it's a great application. The Judaizers claim that Paul was seeking to please men. <laughs> you can see like, well, I'm not going to tell them to keep the law because I want them to like me. Oh, don't we have a lot of that in society today? Yeah, they claim that that's what Paul was doing to please men, not God. So they told the Gentile Christians in Galatia that they were coming, that they were coming, read my own language, that they were coming to complete what Paul had taught, what Paul had left unfinished. If they followed Moses' law, they would be complete, perfect Christians. Well, that's never going to happen. Your perfection, your righteousness is from Christ and because of Christ alone. And so the Galatians were mistaught by those who were mistaught. The Judaizers were wrong in their own uh, assimilation or uh, understanding of the Christian faith. You understand what I'm saying? So a teacher who is on the radio or on the television or some other place, or is, as they used to be standing on a soapbox at uh, the corner of two busy streets in a large town, those people who preached, who whose sermon was wrong, it wasn't that they knew it was wrong, it was that they certainly, they sincerely believed it was wrong. And that's why the New Testament is full of admonitions to correct and rebuke and to point out from the scriptures that certain teachers don't have it all together. And that's something that we do in love, not in order to destroy. I'm not going to take that tangent, but here's the Judaizers. We're going to finish what Paul left unfinished. It's like finishing what Jesus had left unfinished. That's, that's wrong, wrong, wrong. 
Thus, the Judaizers had a two-pronged attack. First, Paul, you're not a real apostle. And second, the gospel is not complete. It omits the essential demands of God. That's, that's the summary of why the book or the letter, we call it a book, but it's a letter of Paul to the Galatian Christians. By the way, I call them Christians. Isn't that correct that they were Christians? You look up Galatians 1, verses 1 and 2. That attack was somewhat successful, as we can tell by reading the letter Paul wrote to the Galatians. They were impressed by the authorities of the authority of the Jewish leaders. This is what Paul was saying. I know that you've been misled, and I'm I'm here to tell you that it's by grace through faith alone. So why do we even have this letter in the New Testament? Why did this become inspired by the Holy Spirit to be put in as part of the thing that you and I call the Bible, the library of 66 books? Why is it one of the 27 books of the New Testament? Why is it important to us? You know, I don't have that in white as a question to you, but it could be. And then I think you would say, Pastor, we've already answered that, right? Well, we as modern day churches today, regardless of how long ago our church was founded, we still easily stray off the path and get off the gospel and um, can get, you know, preachers can preach in the wrong direction, not properly from the Bible. Congregations can mislead uh, by getting involved in customs or, or maybe traditions and system. Mm -hmm. or politics or politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, um, well, I was in the air force and one of the slogans of the air force, at least it was then is that the price of Liberty is eternal vigilance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to keep watching the horizon just as those men on the walls of Jerusalem kept peering out into the darkness, looking to see if someone was coming to attack. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in my generation in the Air Force, we had the dew line, the distant early warning system that had uh, trained its radar eyes and maybe other eyes that we weren't told about upon the horizon to see if anybody was coming across the sea at us. After uh, not 9-11, but the first 9-11 was December 7th, 1941. Right. And uh, there were other times before that that our country was threatened by those across the sea. And it's still going to happen. Now, let me transplant that idea to the faith. We are always looking at the horizon to see if other ideas that are contrary to the gospel are on the horizon coming to attack our faith. The price of God's liberty is this vigilance that is trained by scripture. Mm -hmm. This is not a little game we play where you put in an hour a week, come to church and okay, now I can go back and fire up the grill. We've got company coming over. Okay, <laughs> go ahead and do that. <laughs> but don't forget on Sunday that it's not Memorial Day. This is a day of worship where we go and see what God has to say to us through the scriptures. Mm -hmm. It's not going to end until Christ comes, and then we will be perfect, knowing as we have been known. Well, that's the end of that sermon. <laughs> uh, can't uh, let, we can't let the, the gospel message get watered down. Right. This is the background, and this tells us why St. Paul wrote it, why he wrote this letter to the Galatian Christians. He had one central theme. You are not saved by the law. The gospel is sufficient. Get your thesaurus out and click on shift F7 and look at all the 
the synonyms uh, for the word sufficient. It's complete. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to be added. In that letter, Paul also defends his apostleship. Because, you know, if he isn't a true apostle, he has no right to insist on anything. But if he is called by God, which he was, if he is called by God, then what he says is from God. That makes Paul stand out against all the Judaizers, all of them. I want to give you a very brief outline. All of Gaul is divided into three parts. We learned to say that in Latin uh, in 1956. I can't say it anymore. But it, it requires that all outlines have three parts. <laughs> And the first is the defense of Paul's apostleship, uh, primarily in chapters 1 and 2. Second, the defense of the gospel in chapters 3 and 4. And finally, the defense of the gospel freedom, chapters 5 and 6. So as you read Galatians, you might, might want to keep that outline in mind. You'll find other outlines in your study Bibles. Outlines are like opinions. It's really hard to know or see if Paul was following an, an outline that he had. Ian, you know, when you write an essay, your teacher says, no, before you start writing, I want you to have an outline and hand yeah, it in. Yeah, I do do that. Yeah, well, I always like to do the outline when I was finished. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but when they required you to hand it in early, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Now, how am I going to follow that? Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, well, we won't talk about present writing. Paul may have uh, dictated this letter. It says, this is really minor point. At the end of the letter, no, well, that's in the middle. But in this case, at the end of the letter, he said, see what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Uh, in another part of Galatians, he says that you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. And it is thought that one of the diseases that Paul had was ocular in nature that he couldn't see very well. And a couple of times we read that he has a, a secretary, uh, someone to take dictation, if you want a fancy word for it, a menuensis. <laughs> now you can throw that word away, you will never need it again. But someone who writes down what is said. Okay. Uh, stenographer in the 1950s and maybe 60s. And then we invented a thing like Edison first invented the composition of Mary Had a Little Lamb on that little cylinder. And someone said, well, we can do that magnetically. And we had that dictation machine. And then it was included in a tiny little handheld thing. Mm -hmm. And the secretary would get that and mm -hmm. put her earphones on and she would type what was written. I mean, what was said. Well, this is what Paul apparently did at the end of the letter when he wrote. He had to write in large letters so that he could see what he was writing. Understand? Yes. It's a very minor point. The Galatian letter is very autobiographical. Paul tells us of himself and his passion for the gospel. He recites some of his experiences by way of defending his apostleship. He's essentially, in a different way, recording what he had in Acts chapter 9. I was called directly by Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And you put that at the head of your letter. <laughs> It packs some, uh, what word would you say, 
uh, authority. The letter sharply distinguishes for us the differences or the difference between law and gospel. And this is one of the most important things I want to bring up to you in this whole study. Um, in the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, there was a man who was instrumental in the beginnings of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Anybody know his name? C.F. Walther? Yes, Carl Ferdinand Walther, who was one of the original 14 pastors that met in Chicago in 1847 to form what became the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. One of the things that uh, Professor Walther did at the St. Louis Seminary was to gather the men on Friday night. Friday night? He gathered the men on Friday night and lectured. And they took notes. And they were going to have to know this when they became pastors. And he wrote a rather famous book. Do you know the name of it? Mm -hmm. It's right there in that sentence. The proper distinction between law and gospel. Mm -hmm. oh. And he got it from Luther's commentary on the letter to the Galatians. Mm -hmm. And where did Luther get it? From the letter <laughs> to the Galatians. Uh, more than once, Luther sat down and wrote and, and gave a lecture on Galatians. We're going to look at that. But this sharp distinction between the law and the gospel that uh, you may be tempted to take for granted. Well, I look at my time and I'm, and I'm, I'm done. As we often say, where did the time go? And because this is such an important topic, I don't want to get into it with a couple of minutes left. But if you have time and you want to do extra study, no extra credit here, <laughs> you get an A+. Plus. Uh, uh, go and search for that book online. I think it's online now. The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. C.F.W. Wall. On Amazon, $13. Oh, you're so quick on the draw. <laughs> you and your brother are, the, are alike in that respect. Thank you. Uh, you can buy the book. Can you buy? Can you buy a, a digital edition? I'm sure. Okay. I don't know though. There Usually is a there's a newer edition that I recommend to you, and it came out oh in the last ten years, and it's a reader's edition of the proper distinction between law and gospel, how to read and apply. How to read and apply the Bible. Yeah. And I read the entire book cover to cover because I wanted to hear again what he said on those Friday night lectures. Imagine men in the seminary, instead of going out and partying. <laughs> I hope they don't do that. But instead of uh, anything else, they were all single then. They weren't married. They stayed on the campus where they lived and they listened to these wonderful lectures. And those were not recorded electronically, of course, but the people, they took notes and then later it was published and it became required reading for every seminarian and still is to this day, I believe. Hmm. Pastor, for our viewers, uh, can I make a, a typo correction? Sure, sure. Um, I was following along here in the Bible, and I think the Galatians 3.11 that you had quoted should be Galatians 6.11. Ah, uh, I knew it was at the end of the letter. Thank you yeah. for that. Um, if they're looking for it and following their Bible. Oh, good, good, good catch, as they say. So this distinguished between law and gospel, the main reason I really want to study Galatians with you is not this uh, Judaizers thing, but that once we have the gospel, we understand the proper distinction. I think you can tell what's a law and what's the gospel. But here is the, this is where it comes to real life. This is where the struggle is. 
this is just to whet your appetite. Mm. When you are struggling with your own sin or with the sin of someone you love and you're having an encounter to know how to apply the law and when to apply the law and how to apply the gospel and when to apply the gospel. Let me quote Luther. He said, this is an art taught by the Holy Spirit in the school that he teaches. If you can properly distinguish between law and gospel, said Luther, I will award you a doctor's hat. <clears throat> it is not easy. Wow. You understand? This is this is deep stuff. It is. But it is so beautiful and and so rewarding to study this. And if you want to go off on a tangent of your own and and oh. spend a couple of months or three I I'm going too far but just just go and and look at at some of this beautiful writing of Dr. Walther and Luther, if you, if you can do a little more work and find it in the commentary to the Galatians. There is a commentary of the Galatians online. I think it's the 1531 edition. I'm not sure of that, but you can read it. It's archaic English. It's hard reading, but, um, you know, go after some of that delicious stuff. It's, it's just wonderful. Now I'm just overselling it, which I usually do. I love you guys, and I want you to have this in your heart. And the people who tune in later, I don't know who they are, where they are, but I sure welcome you to do the same. And I want you to know that. Oh, God in heaven, thank you for the gospel of Jesus, which has brought us to faith by the work of the Holy Spirit so that we might know what you want for us and so that we might love others as you have loved and forgiven us. It is so wonderful to be part of what you want and so awful to be on the other side. Warn us when we stray and warn our teachers if they stray and grant that your church will be built up in the most holy faith for the glory that belongs to you and to you alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.